Hi, this is the Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available online free for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, England, established 1809. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Chris. Also with us is Rick Samuelson, graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts. He was also a retired head of securities, UBS Japan. Welcome, Rick. Hi, thank, thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format of the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept for your consideration and our panel will react with criticisms, questions, their own definitions, etc. This week, the subject concept of usage is citizenship, dual citizenship, and immigration. Present in the current political polemics is the controversy of citizenship. Within the concept of this topic are questions that arise about what should be the laws that govern U.S. immigration, citizenship, and more recently, dual citizenship, or even multiple citizenships. To begin our understanding, let's go to the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, whereby it reads as follows. Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Okay, this statement indicates that citizens of the U.S. are born or naturalized and have privileges and immunities. The amendment indicates that examples of these privileges and immunities are the citizens' right to the life, to the enjoyment of life, liberty, and property. It further indicates that other privileges are the enjoyment of the equal protection of the laws. This understanding is commensurate with an, with an historical perspective of the nature of, of citizenship. Aristotle's characterization of the citizen was one who is capable of ruling or being ruled. Citizens are, first and foremost, as Aristotle said in his politics, quote, those who share in the holding of office, unquote. Hence, if a person can participate in the holding of an office in the government, and that person would be a citizen. I would contend that without Aristotle's right of participation in the government, the people would be best described as subjects. Later in history, the Romans, as they created their empire, extended citizenship to the conquered people, which meant that these citizens were protected by Roman law, thereby extending the privileges of citizenship from holding of office to protection of the laws set by the Roman government, and thus generating a legal status. With this legal status comes the notion of political freedom, which is the protection of the citizen from other individuals and from the functionaries of government. More recently, it has come to indicate a community of people that share a common heritage, such as a territory, culture, religion, and or set of laws. If we were to make some notes on this, 
we would note that the totalitarian society, which is an example of which would be a, a monarchy, produces or has subjects. These subjects, if you add in privileges and immunities, then it equals citizens. They become c subjects, become citizens. And the citizens, and within the citizens uh, are their privileges and immunities. And to delineate those, first would be holding office, as Aristotle indicated. Two would be the protection of the law, as Roman law has uh, indicates. Three would be political liberty, liberty, as Locke and others have described, which is protecting individuals from others and from the government. And more recently, common culture. It is within this last concept of citizenship that is a people that share a common heritage or culture or religion that a controversy of the natures of citizenship begins to develop. There is now an idea that a similar culture is needed or a will to assimilate into a national culture that is required for citizenship. Thus, in the polemics of immigration, the first step in the process of becoming a citizen is to generate the rules to become a citizen which would be necessary in the setting of immigration policy. Once a citizen, some questions arise, such as whether dual citizenship is congruous with the nature of citizenship, as dual citizenship is now part of U.S. policy. Let's go to our panel for a discussion on the criteria for citizenship and immigration policy. My first policy question is, once becoming a citizen of a country, could there be a justifiable policy that would allow for dual citizenship? I dare say the Athenians or the Romans, where the concept of the citizen has some roots, would not have allowed for dual citizenship. How now this uh, concept of dual citizenship? Mark, your comments first, please. Sure, Chris, the Athenians uh, missed one real big benefit that happened after they were around, and that's the French Revolution and all the moronic ideas that came out of it. So maybe if they'd lived through the French Revolution, they would have felt on for this crap. Uh, and, and to answer your question, no, dual citizenship is wrong. It's, it's just an absolute wrong. It shouldn't even be debated. I, I, I'm sorry that we're having this debate, but I wanted to take a step back because this does tie into immigration and it does tie into what we talked to about last week. And I saved this article from the uh, Wall Street Journal this week, which talks about how in Canada, an Afghan immigrant and his wife were found guilty of honor killings. Uh, and this is what I kept talking about during the immigration show. Uh, a country is really comprised of, what's most important is language, history, and culture. And I kept getting pushback from you guys saying, well, you know, it depends what business needs we have. Just wanna show you what happens when we ignore the concepts of language, history, and culture when we allow, who, when we decide who is gonna to come to this country. This guy up in Canada uh, was uh, convicted of murdering three of his daughters, and the prosecution argued it was honor rooted in Afghan tribal traditions that led Mr. Shafiat to cleanse the shame he felt from the conduct of his, of his re three rebellious daughters. The eldest two took unapproved, unapproved boyfriends, and all three disobeyed their father through independent behavior and sometimes revealing dress. Rona Amir Mohammed, who was Mr. Shafiat's first spouse in the polygamous family was also killed because she was a troublesome first wife and a lenient stepmother. So when we start deciding that Intel is gonna tell us how many computer programmers they need or whatever other, whatever other American large unpatriotic corporation is gonna start saying, well, we need people with these specific talents while ignoring things like tribal customs that have no place in Western society and really no place in humanity these are the kind of things that come onto our shores. I would also you know, point out the local press uh, printed it, part of the police transcript of a ranting Mr. Shafia calling his daughters whores and boasting, nothing is more dear to me than my honor. While they might agree somewhat with him about the concept of honor, anybody who walks around in this country calling their daughters whores is 
to put it mildly, a pariah and probably should have the state come down very harshly on him. So citizenship, immigration, it doesn't really matter what the economy needs. It matters a little bit, but longer term, if you want to have polygamous marriages, you know, almost last week, it was almost like I was making this stuff up. Here it is in this week's Wall Street Journal. Dual citizenship, I can't even believe we need to have this conversation, and, and, and it's just despicable we've gotten us all. You know, the governor of California was a dual citizen during the entire term of his, of his uh, tenure. Arnold Schwarzenegger kept his Austrian citizenship. That's nauseating. And, and you know, it probably speaks to his character. Look what happened to his marriage. And look why it happened to his marriage. Rick, uh, any uh, any response? Well, I, I would simply start by pointing out the frequent use of tax dodges by dual citizens. I mean, this is commonly known and uh, obviously abhorrent from the point of view of someone like myself who's a citizen of just the United States and has no plans to do otherwise. So <clears throat> I think on that score as well, uh, the fact that this is so prone to abuse uh, means it just simply shouldn't be allowed, period. Now in practice it's very hard to police uh, because it's difficult for the U.S. government to oftentimes discover whether uh, someone has taken another citizenship, but if it is discovered, the penalty should be extremely severe. Yeah, Chris, it's hard to police, but really what we need in this case uh, is, is policing through the public, which would be more of a public shaming function. So if you go to your office tomorrow and you say to everybody, oh yeah, I got busted going 80 miles an hour on the highway, everybody will kind of just turn up their, turn away and say, oh, whatever, I speed all the time. If you went into your office tomorrow and said, Hey, check this out. I just got a check for ten thousand dollars from the insurance company because I lied about a claim and they sent me this check. You might not get busted for that, but everyone sitting around you is going to think less of you. So what we need in this country uh, is is perhaps uh, people to recognize that this is really something that has long-term potential harm for this country. The concept of dual citizenship and serving in foreign militaries, which is so ridiculous. Again, I can't believe we need to discuss it. But it has to come down to a point where people stand up and say, you know what, I don't think it's so cool that you have two passports. Because in the, at the end of the day, the United States, forget about the tax dodges, at the end of the day, the United States could go to war with any country, and probably will. The United States could go to war with any country at any time. So if we have people here who have not renounced their citizenship, we have a problem. We had a problem, we thought we had a problem with Japanese citizens on the West Coast during World War II. One part that people always leave out is that many of those people, that, the Japanese Americans that we interned, had renounced their American citizenship. Now, when you renounce your American citizenship, in order to be a Japanese citizen, by the way, you're not allowed to have dual citizenship. When you renounce your American citizenship, not a lot of sympathy. That basically makes you an enemy combatant. That, not a lot of sympathy when you get rounded up and interned. So the ones who renounce their citizenship, we got to talk about that differently. But Again, I, it's just sad that this country has sunk into a point where we now have to discuss the concept of people having multiple passports. Because remember, Chris, nations don't have friends. People think, oh, well, that nation's our friend, this nation's our friend. Nation, go back to inter international relations 101. Nations don't have friends, they have interests. Now, I know there are a lot of ethnic lobbies that will tell you that, well, that country is our lifelong friend. You know, there shouldn't be an, a, an inch of daylight between our policies. Bottom line is, you know, we had a really strong ally during World War II. His name was Joseph Stalin. There's none of his policies that we like today. And you talk to your garden variety Republican today, and even though France saved us in the Revolutionary War, they all hate France for just moronic reasons. But even our closest quote unquote allies, uh, really, we just have to look out for the national interest. Is not uh, the dual, uh, this dual citizenship concept something of uh, recent occurrence? I don't think it was uh, previously allowed. Uh, uh, is that correct, Mark? Yeah, that's right. There was a there was a Supreme Court case in the mid '60s. Afroyim was the name. Uh, but you know, so so they said it's not illegal. Uh, but legality does not equal morality or, or or proper ethics. You know, it's it's not illegal. If you invite me over for dinner, it's not illegal for me to come over and spew nothing but four letter words at you and your wife. I have not broken a law. But what I've done is horrible and despicable, and it shouldn't happen. It is immoral. So it is is. As I understand it, the Supreme Court has allowed for dual citizenship, uh, where it was previously assumed that dual citizenship was 
not allowed. Uh, the Supreme Court reversed that precedent, and now uh, dual citizenship is allowed. Uh, what should America do to uh, uh, so that dual citizenship be, become illegal? Uh, I, I think we uh, have established that it's dual allegiance can come with can come with conflicts uh, that are uh, that are undesirable here. So, uh, especially when concerning taxes, as Rick pointed out, and especially concerning the military. Um, so. What do you? What would you propose uh, going forward, uh, Mark? Oh, I thought Rick was going to answer the solution. I have my solution, but let's let Rick. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll start with your solution. Uh, my solution yes. would be. I mean, it's pretty clearly spelled out what the punishment for treason is in the Constitution, and I don't see serving in a foreign military or carrying a passport all that much different from treason. So it's it's already spelled out for you. Uh, and by the way, Chris, you would somebody probably along the line, either the founders or everybody since then, thought that, well, we don't have to spell this out because it's so obvious. I mean, is, is, should, should 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 we just should we have a law against dual citizenship? They're probably scratching their head, saying, well, it's not going to be an issue. You know, we we just got our freedom from England. Let's let, why why would we want to have a dual citizenship? Right, uh, Rick. Any further well, comments? Well, the legislature can. Uh, supersede the Supreme Court, I'm, you know, and therefore there's clearly a, a legislative venue for making a law that would make dual citizenship illegal and serving in a foreign military equally illegal and punishable by uh, traditionally death. I, I, yeah, I, I, oddly enough, Rick brings up, you know, <laughs> what the punishment is, but now. I, I know people, you know, carrying multiple passports. Their kids serve in this foreign military. It's almost like they go off to summer camp, and people are proud of that. And 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 most of my friends find it nauseating. Well, it's uh, certainly uh, something uh, that's never occurred before in history. I, I think the uh, European countries, uh, many have uh, uh, the uh, dual citizenship uh, uh, option available. Uh, is that that's some, some, Chris? Some some do, some don't. Uh, you know, you can look at Azerbaijan, China, the Czech Republic, Denmark, India, Indonesia, Japan, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, Nepal, the Netherlands, and Norway. You automatically lose your citizenship if you acquire another one voluntarily. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of of what countries do and do not allow. In Saudi Arabia, it's uh, criminal penalties for exercising another citizenship, which is as simple an act as showing another passport. And you know what the punishment for crimes is in Saudi Arabia. So it just shows, you know, there are other places where people actually respect and, and think that citizenship is important. Here, when, when we're this quote unquote nation of immigrants and, you know, uh, we have, we have uh, no care for our borders and we're out remaking the world, who cares if Americans are walking around with five passports, whatever? Tax the rich. That's, I guess that's the answer. <laughs> well said. So uh, going forward, uh, uh, we should just, I think, probably pass a law. Wouldn't that? Uh, wouldn't you agree with that, uh, Mark? As a as a press, as a way to go forward in solving this problem? Yeah, but just to go back to my earlier point, you know, we we can pass a law, Chris. But really, you know, people respond more to public shaming. We passed laws against smoking, and how many how many times have you seen somebody light up a cigarette somewhere where they're not, not allowed to smoke and get fined? That's not what really is stopping that person from smoking. What's stopping him is the public shame. He's looking around thinking, I don't want everybody in this room to hate me. So we want to have that same thing here. No one's going to catch people with multiple passports. It'll happen once in a while. But really what we need to do is publicly shame these people into either, you know, make a choice. Either you're an American or you're not an American. It's the principle of non-contradiction come to life. Okay. Um you know, I think we all agree that dual citizenship should be looked at by the legislature, and uh, and, uh, uh, and and I think Mark, your point uh, uh, that uh, shame is also a a uh, uh, a motivator uh, in our society. So, uh, but let's let's move on to the the larger topic of immigration uh, within uh, within citizenship and and dual citizenship. So, uh, you mentioned uh, common culture or. Uh, uh, that uh, citizens uh, applying for uh, 
uh, citizenship here in the U.S. Uh, should be have to take an oath of common culture and that immigration should uh, accommodate uh, a uh, uh, this idea that's uh, occurred in the last hundred years ago, a uh, hundred years or so of uh, common culture and uh, uh, so uh, w would you not, uh, do you think that should also be incorporated into the rules of immigration? Well, I find that very limiting. I, I, I said language, history, and culture. So you've well, got to speak English. I'm a big fan of foreign languages. Speak all you want, but we've got to all have one common language. We have to have a common culture because, honestly, I don't find polygamous marriages where you murder your first spouse all that enticing. I don't find situations where men are ranting in public, calling their daughters whores, and saying nothing is important, more important than their honor. That's not part of our culture. That's not something I want. If you're not willing to assimilate and, and not scream that your daughter's a whore and not kill your polygamous wife and to think that you're going to get off because it was all about your honor, that's not Western culture. That's not American culture. You're probably not a good fit here. And lastly, history. You know, there are certain countries with historical gripes against the United States who don't agree with our take or our version of how things happen and why they happen. And those people come here with grudges and gripes. And, you know, I don't want them to come here and fly more planes into towers. So there are people who are e more easily assimilable, assimilable into this country and come with good intentions. And there are people who are not assimilable but come and fake it with bad intentions. And those are the ones we have to weed out. Rick, do uh, you have any thoughts on that, on, on that subject? Well, let me take a step back. Uh, what's re what, one remarkable thing about U.S. immigration policy that's you know, common to any bureaucratically controlled effort is that it's not responsive to the conditions of the economy. So, for example, I think Obama's administration has handed out about three million work permits during his administration, uh, it can't possibly be the case that there are jobs for all these people, right? Right. That's an impossibility, not in this environment. So because the nature of the law with all of its uh, concessions to reuniting families and distant relatives and diversity and all of this other social engineering because of the prevalence of the way the immigration policy is legally structured and carried out by the uh, bureaucracy, you have people who aren't terribly qualified, who don't in many cases speak English, who potentially are a drain on the economy at a time when uh, our federal debt is exploding on account of various and sundry entitlements. And so, you know, the first observation I would make is that the immigration policy can't be driven by a, a government bureaucracy and be either fair or effective but most importantly, effective. From a businessman's perspective, uh, when I was employing foreigners uh, in Asia, for example, uh, it was th the fact that you had to jump through as many hoops as you had to do to get somebody from another country on board was a nuisance, but you could do it. And the fact that the specifications in other countries are so focused on qualifications, right? Correct. Uh, and that the immigration policy is ori orientated toward providing work permits, but not necessarily immigration rights, okay, made it much more effective from that country's perspective. So one of the problems with the immigration debate here is that the distinction between work permits that are temporary versus full citizenship rights, which should be given out very, very sparingly, 
because it's so readily abused, and we, you can see that in the costs associated with the existing immigration policy, right? Whether it's anchor babies or you know grandmothers that are brought over or distant relatives because of the policy we have in place. So the 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 point of departure for me in this debate is until the government makes a very clear distinction between a work permit, which is a temporary permit, and could you know might uh, under the right circumstances lead to citizenship, but there should be a lot of hoops to jump through, all right, and qualifications and commitment and and so forth, versus this kind of let's bring as many people as possible as quickly as possible so we can bolster the ranks of the Democratic Party approach, which is what we have in the United States today. Chris, That's the problem with that is that temporary work permits allow people to come here and then they become permanent residents because they don't go back. And then we have to hear nonsense from, from clowns like John McCain and Newt Gingrich and Ronald Reagan proposing amnesty for these people after they overstay their welcome. So whether they come here legally or not, when, in the case of when they come here legally on a work permit, they don't leave. And then it's not the Democratic Party trying to pull them in and get them as voters. It's the Republican Party fighting at the same time for them. So that all sounds great in theory. In practice, it doesn't work. We had the amnesty under Reagan. John McCain tried every trick in the book to give you know those who are here illegally, uh, illegal aliens, I call them fugitives because they're fugitives from the law, technically. Uh, John McCain tried everything in his bag of tricks, but thank God he was too demented and 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 physically incapable of winning that he didn't get to pass this through. You hear the same garbage from Romney, a little bit less so. Gin Gingrich wants your town to decide if the illegal people in your town should be allowed to stay. A lot of those people came on temporary work visas. We have no enforcement mechanism, and more importantly, we have no spine to tell these people, hey, time's up, you got to go, because then they sit there and go, oh, but I bought a house, I have a family. You know, I bought a car. Why, why do I have to leave now? Oh, that wasn't the deal. Oh, but hum, you know, human suffering. You're going to make me leave now? So, sounds great in theory. It does not work. We've seen it happen just in the last 30 years. Well, uh, that's about all the time we have for this session. Great I'd summation. Like to, I'd like to um, <laughs> thank Rick and Mark for joining us. And uh, thank you very much for viewing The Philosophical Angle. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.